This is the West Virginia Soccer Association Beyond the Pitch podcast on the WVSA Digital Network. From the Sport Pens International Studios in Charleston, West Virginia, here's your host, Marcus Cole. Welcome to the podcast. We have another great show on tap. Before we welcome our guests, I want to remind you to like, subscribe, and share our program. This helps us get the word out to others and let them know that we're providing valuable information designed for soccer players, coaches, referees, and parents. With us today is Marty Beal, head coach, University of Richmond Women's Soccer. Marty, welcome back to the program. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. And we're thankful uh, you had time in your schedule. You guys are in a, uh, a dead period right now for recruiting, so at least a little bit of a breather here uh, during the holiday season for you. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Marty, like I said, is the head coach, University of Richmond women's soccer team, uh, Division One, uh, plays in the Atlantic 10 Conference, coming off a, a pretty successful season, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, we made strides in the right direction, you know, that. so I guess you can call that successful. Obviously, we, we'd like to have a few more wins in the win column and, and advance a little bit further in the, the A-10 tournament. But, you know, we had the most wins in, in the past 10 years in conference play and advanced to the conference tournament for the first time in seven years. So, yeah, definitely made some strides in the right direction. Uh, so the future's looking really bright, and I'm excited about it. Awesome. Now, recently, you had a tweet. Uh, We follow uh, Marty online on Twitter, and the tweet said this. The more I recruit and the more I watch my own kids play sports, the more I realize the problem with youth sports is mainly due to the parents and their unrealistic expectations for their kids. And too many times they allow their emotions to control their behaviors on the sidelines. If parents could just relax and simply enjoy watching their kids compete, it would be a much more enjoyable experience for everyone. Well, I saw this tweet and thought a lot about it, and it kept coming up on my mind, which is the reason why we're having you on the show to kind of talk a little bit about this and also into college recruiting. Talk to us about what led to this tweet from you. Well, in that particular moment, I was uh, recruiting and watching a particular game, and uh, the the referee, uh, unfortunately, was not calling some good good calls and was missing some plays, and and the parents were just going irate and just really berating the referee and then, then yelling at their own players, their own daughters to, you know, play harder, hit harder. You know, they're not going to call us or run through them as, you know, play like you're playing rugby and just on and on and on. And it just became like, just really got to me, I, I guess you could say. And, you know, I also coach youth soccer and, and I see the parents on the sidelines and how much they uh, yell at their kids to do certain things and kind of coach them from the sidelines. And I'm like, if everybody would just relax and just sit back and take a deep breath, you know, the game would be so much more enjoyable with it. The kids would really enjoy the game and, and certainly the fans I think would enjoy it as well. I agree. Um, And unfortunately I was sort of one of those parents when I first started out. Um, I've mellowed as the years have gone on and I now thoroughly enjoy just sitting back in my chair and just relaxing, watching my daughter. My daughter plays uh, D2 college soccer here in the state. And just, I really just enjoy watching her and her teammates play. Yeah, and that's, that's the way it should be. And, and, and I know 99% of parents come from a good place. They, they want to see their child be successful. They want to see them, you know, uh, work hard and, and be successful and gain confidence and you know, reach new levels of play and, and they, you know, they, they want what's best for their kid and they want their teams, their kids team to be successful. So, so I know they're coming from that place, but it's just understanding that, okay, if you want that to happen, there's a different way to help make that happen for your daughter and for, for her team. Yeah, absolutely. What advice would you give to parents that maybe need to apply some more self-awareness when it comes to their child and maybe their abilities out on the soccer field? Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think um, I think uh, you know, I see parents who kind of walk around a little bit and kind of walk away from the the group of parents and just just kind of separate themselves. And I think those are parents that are trying to calm their own mind and, and keep themselves calm and cool collective uh so that's a, that's a way i think that the the number one thing though is that we have to recognize our own emotions we have to re- be self-aware of where we are emotionally in that given moment 
and recognize those cues and, and recognize, okay, what direction do I want to go with this? And that, that self-awareness, I think, is the biggest key that um, I don't think a lot of us recognize quick enough. I think a lot of us recognize it like 30 minutes afterwards, after the game is over and after we've lost our cool and like, oh, man, that was stupid of me. That was ridiculous. I shouldn't have done that. And I think we, myself included, have to, to recognize those emotional cues earlier on so that we don't get to that point to where we do lose control emotionally. Now, you mentioned you were out on the recruiting trail just recently. Um, when you see that, what what goes through your mind? <laughs> How's your kid responding? That's a great, yeah. I mean, that's a great point. You know, so just watching the players respond. And so, you know, I think that, again, that's why we as adults have a, have a role to play in the development of these young people. They look to us as the example. And if we're losing control and if we're yelling at officials and we're yelling, you know, crazy things, then these kids are going to start doing the same thing and thinking that it's okay to lose control of their own emotions while they're playing and, and respond in negative ways. And so I think we as adults have to, you know, do a better job. So, so certainly looking at how, you know, players are responding on the field is, is a big, big part of that process. When you're out there recruiting, looking at some players, considering them for your program, what characteristics are you specifically looking for? Yeah, we're, we're looking for positive, relentless players. And what I mean by positive is, is not players who are just smiling all the time and just out there laughing and having a good old time. But the game is full of, full of mistakes. So, but, so when we talk about positivity, we're talking about, you know, solving problems, you know, how players are looking to solve problems, not, not complain about the, the negative thing that just happened, the mistake that just happened, but how can we solve this problem? What can I do to recover back defensively? Or what can I do to, you know, get to that loose ball quicker? You know, that type of positive mentality. And then the relentlessness, you know, they, they never give up. That if they're down three nothing with 10 minutes in the game, they're still fighting as hard as they can to help their team be successful. So those are the two characteristics that we really look for as, as players that when we're recruiting at the University of Richmond. Can you walk us through, I, I really want to give parents and also players a, a look into what a typical week for an incoming freshman college soccer player looks like at Richmond. I mean, obviously we're talking just from your program um, and obviously things change and things are different, but what are some expectations from school to soccer to social? Can you kind of walk us through a little bit of that? I think that the first part is freshmen have to come in recognizing they're, they're no longer going to be, you know, top, top dog in the, in the, on the team. You know, and I think that's sometimes the, the biggest struggle for incoming freshmen is to, you know, realize that there are players around them that are, that are older than them, that are more experienced and that are simply better players. And so, you know, understanding that, that, that mindset coming in, I just have to learn. I got to work hard and I got to grow every single day and every single day just be focused on my improvement and being the best I can for my team. And I think entering college with that type of my, mindset will set them up for success throughout their freshman year. Um, you know, getting into the, the normal academic year, you know, you obviously have your preseason, which is just, you know, training sessions and team meetings and individual meetings and things like that that we go through for about two and a half weeks or so before classes actually start. Now, once classes start, you know, at Richmond, we, we practice in the mornings. On, so, so Mondays are their day off. So that way they can do their labs and, and have some night classes and things like that. Have a, have a day off during the week that's an academic day so they can meet with professors and just really zoom in on their, their academics uh, for that day. Tuesdays, we'd practice first thing in the morning. So we're out at the fields at 7 a.m. Uh, we train to about, to about uh, 8.45. And then they, go <clears throat> excuse me. and then they go straight into the weight room. And so, so basically on Tuesdays, they have, you know, from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. is, you know, soccer practice and, and weights. Then the uh, first class they'll have would be at 1030 in the morning. If they have a class at 1030, they don't have to, but that would be the earliest class that they would take on a Tuesday. Then the rest of the day is just spent academically. So generally speaking, they'll have two or three classes, you know, after, the, after our practices throughout the day and afternoon. And again, Tuesdays are another good day to get a, their science labs and the, those lab requirements in as well. Um, and then, you know, at night, is, is, it's a grind, it's studying. It's not just, you know, sit back and relax and, you know, binge watch, you know, your favorite show on Netflix. It is, you know, 100%, you know, in the library or, you know, we have a great academic service here, area here for our student athletes. And so, you know, most of them are spending, you know, two to three hours a night 
you know, in that academic center, you know, working on their projects and working on assignments and studying for tests and, and things of that such. Then on Wednesday, um, they have classes generally in the morning and because we'll practice around four o'clock in the afternoon. And so, um, you know, those two days are really set up to, uh, for them to get their soccer stuff in, but then also allow them time to get their academic work in. But on top of that, Marcus, they have to, you know, do their, their rehab. Uh, they got to do their recovery work. Um, many players want to put in extra work on the field. So we'll have, you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions with coaching staff and on the fields and things of that such. So you, so you have those two days that you spend a lot of time uh, <laughs> devoted to soccer <laughs> that, that many players don't think about. Um, and I think that's a critical thing to, to understand when, when, when you're competing at a high level, it really is like a job. It really is because in terms of the time that you spend invested in, in, in that sport and investing in your development as a player, but you can enjoy that job. You can, you can love your job. Like I have a job where I work, you know, sometimes, you know, 70 hours, 70 to 80 hours a week, but I love it. I, I, I it's never a grind for me. It's never um, a struggle for me. It's as we talk to our players about it. Yes, things are hard. You got to put a lot of time and effort into it, but it can still be enjoyable. You got to love what you're doing. You got to have that, that purpose to, to really get after it and, and understand why you're getting up every single day to to be the best you can for this for this program and then so that's kind of the two, two, sorry go ahead no go ahead so that's the tuesday wednesday schedule and then thursdays are our game days so we purposefully you know have that morning's uh time blocked off to where they can sleep in so because on tuesdays we practice in the mornings so you can't have class on a thursday morning because that would mean a tuesday morning class as well so, so they don't have classes tuesday or thursday morning until 10 30 so that way on game days, they can sleep in because rest is very, very vital to their performance, uh, um, as we all know. So we'll have a game Thursday afternoon or Thursday evening, depending if we're home and on the road. Uh, Friday afternoon, uh, so, so at Richmond, we're very fortunate that um, most of the classes here are Monday, Wednesday classes or Tuesday, Thursday classes. So very few of our players have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. So a lot of our players have no classes on Fridays. So we'll practice early afternoon on a Friday, um, to, and that would just be a, a light uh, post-game practice. And then Saturday morning, generally in the you know, 10, 11 o'clock time frame, we'll, we'll get another practice in, and that'll be a pre-game practice to get ready for our upcoming game on Sunday. So that's kind of the, the typical week of, of the athlete. And I'm glad you brought up the point of it being a job because it is a job, um, you know, between the hours that you're putting in with training, and then once you get into your your season, um, sometimes you got to be on the road, so that kind of messes things up a little bit, and you got to do things a little bit different. Uh, you know, sometimes you're not traveling that far, sometimes you're traveling far. Um, and, yeah, we had uh, two times this year. We left. Uh, we had flights first thing on a Wednesday morning. And we didn't fly back until a uh, Friday evening. So wow. we're going, you know, for three days. And then we had another trip where we were gone for from Wednesday morning until Sunday evening. So uh, you know, sometimes the schedule definitely, uh, definitely puts you on the road for a little while. Yeah. And then you got to come back and make up classwork and make up uh, everything else that comes with it. And then you got to recover on top of it. You know, traveling is, is hard on, on an athlete. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of parents over the years, I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I hear them talk about their son or daughter is going to go to a D1 school, they're going to play soccer, they're going to play on a full scholarship. <laughs> um, I'm sure you've heard that too over your years. Um, talk to us a little bit about the practicality of that. Yeah, it's, the, it's really an unrealistic expectation again when we go back to my tweet you know about the expectations of parents and you know why are their kids playing sports and you know sometimes parents you know put their kids in sports so that they can get that college scholarship and and in my personal opinion that's the wrong reason to put them in into sports you know you put them into sports they learn how to be a good human being they get they get friendships and they learn the value of working hard and being relentless overcoming obstacles and so there's, there's a lot of character development that can happen in sports and if they happen to be good enough and have the desire to play after high school and you know into college then then great um, and if they happen to be at a level where they can get you know some act, uh, athletic scholarship dollars great uh, but the idea that they're going to go in and get a full athletic scholarship is um, very rare so the in division one there's a mac each team could have a maximum of 14 scholarships however not everybody's fully funded so uh, so like at Richmond, you know, we have 12 scholarships, so we're not fully funded. 
And if you have a roster, you know, most division one programs have a roster of around 30 players, give or take a few. So if you take that and you have 12 scholarships and 30 players, well, automatically you see that there's definitely going to be players who uh, have more money than others and definitely players who have maybe even no money as well, as well as, you know, what we call a recruited walk on. Um, you know, so, so we have to divide up that scholarship dollars as best we can to get the players that we can for that particular class. So some, some schools, you know, save money to be able to reward players as they go through their college career. You know, so maybe as a freshman, they're coming in and they're only getting, I should say, $10,000. But by their junior year, they've you know, performed well. And so now they're getting $20,000. And maybe even their senior year, they're getting twenty-five dollars or $30,000. So some programs operate where they, they hold back money to be able to reward upperclassmen as they're going through the process and as they're developing. And some programs just you know, divide up those scholarship dollars right away you know, based off of who's graduating out. So if you have you know, three scholarships that are graduating out amongst you know, seven or eight players that are graduating, then you use those three scholarships to be able to bring in another, you know, seven or eight players to re to replace what, what is left. And everywhere is so different in how they do that. Um, you know, I've heard of some programs where they have very, you know, a new president will come in and they have very little money available to them anymore compared to what they used to have. Um, I know a lot of players that, um, you know, play in, you know, maybe division two that are from the state that they play in. So, you know, offering, you know, scholarship money there for athletics is, you know, maybe not the priority as compared to somebody who's coming from out of state that has to pay those higher uh, prices than an in-state player would. So, I mean, there's so many dynamics when it comes to scholarship money in athletics. Absolutely. And I think uh, sometimes parents who are just unfamiliar with the process of things, maybe hear stories, especially of football or basketball, where those are, you know, basically what's called a counter sport, where, where if you're on a scholarship in basketball at Division One, then that means you're on a full scholarship. You know, they don't they don't give out half, half scholarships or you know, a quarter scholarship. It's a full scholarship. Same thing with football. So, whereas soccer is is not a full scholarship. It is, you know, a, a um, you can divide up those scholarship dollars however that coach uh, needs to to be able to get the, the class that he needs for that for that recruiting cycle. And that's why it's important for our athletes to make sure they're taking care of their academics because that's where a lot of that money comes from to be able to go to these schools. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're 100% going to college for your academics priority. That must be your priority. And you're going there to get a degree. Yes, you're going to play soccer as well because you love and you enjoy the sport. Um, but your priority it must be the academic side of things. So, you know, even in high school, taking care of your grades and, and doing the best you can is really, really important um, so that you can get into the schools that you're looking to get into, but then also it'll set you up to be successful while you're there as well. I'm a firm believer of the fact that if a soccer player wants to play soccer in college, there's a place for them to play. Um, as long as they have realistic expectations, you may not get to go to the school that you wanted to, but, you know, I mean, growing up, my daughter, you know, was a big fan of Anson Dorrance and the University of North Carolina Tar Heels <laughs> and wanted to go play there when she was little. She had these aspirations, Dad, I'm going to go be a Tar Heel. I'm going to go here. And then as time goes up and the development continues, you know, but she's, you know, she's playing Division II soccer and is loving it. But I believe that there is a place for everybody that wants to play soccer in college. Do you agree with that? Oh, 100 percent. And there, there are over a thousand college soccer programs across the country at various levels of play between junior college level, between NAIA, NCAA, Division three, Division two and Division one. There is 100 percent a place for a player who wants to wants to play, who just absolutely loves the game and wants to compete on a team and, and enjoy playing in her in her college career. Uh, but you hit the nail on the head. There has to be that realistic expectation about what level is appropriate for, for me to, to be able to compete. And, and that's where I think the, the club, the club and high school coaches have to do a little bit better job. Um, you know, part of my tweet, I think, uh, you know, we talk about the parents, you know, owning their process and owning their, their responsibility in making the game better and then having realistic expectations. But I think that the coaches have a job in that as well. And I think that uh, there, there are too many club coaches out there who 
you know, only sing the praises of their kids and, you know, just want their kids to, to be confident and, and then also, you know, want to be able to sell the fact that they're, they're, these kids are playing Division One soccer, so you need to come play for me because I'm going to get you a Division One scholarship. And instead of just being really realistic with these athletes and saying, hey, you, you're probably more geared towards this level of play or this is probably the area of, of uh, the, the level that you want to focus in on. And just helping them being realistic, you know, if you want to play at a higher level, here are the two or three things that you got to focus on every single day for the next six months to, or to a year to, to grow your, your level of play, to reach that level that you're aspiring to. Um, I, don't, I don't think enough of that is happening out there. I agree. Um, and also, too, I think what goes overlooked a lot is we, we pick the program that we want to play for, but not necessarily the school we want to go to. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen this happen a number of times that, you know, a player goes in and they play somewhere and, you know, right before the season starts, ACL goes out on them and it's like, you know, they're not playing for the next year. And are you at a school that number one has the major that you're interested in pursuing the degree that you're interested in pursuing? Do you like the campus? Do you like the people on the campus? Do you like the social aspect of the campus? And all this other stuff, I think we overlook that fact, you know, when you go to school, are you going to be happy here if you're not playing soccer? Talk to us about yeah. that. Yeah, I think, I think it's all part of the, 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 the puzzle that you're putting together. You know, each, each individual has their own puzzle that they're trying to create. And I think, I think soccer is definitely part of that puzzle. You know, I think it, you know, it's, it's part of the reason why people come to the University of Richmond, but I also know they come to the University of Richmond because of the location. They come there because of the size of the school. They come because of the prestigious academic environment, you know. So there are many factors that, that go into making a decision as to where you're going to go to school. Um, but I think soccer, you know, is, is a part of that process as well, but it can't be the only part. You know, there has to be multiple pieces of that, of that puzzle to put together to, to have a full picture, to really enjoy your full college experience. You got to think about you know, all the aspects of that college, you know, um, not just the soccer program. Obviously, as you're recruiting, um, I'm, I'm seeing so many posts on Twitter, uh, players that are uh, scrambling to find a place to play in college. Um, it's almost as if, and I, and, and this is just based on tweets that I've seen, so there's not a whole lot of context I can put into it, but um, it almost seems like they want to send a mass email out to every coach in the country or whatever region about, you know, here's my video highlight and here's an invitation to a showcase that I'm going to be at. And they expect the coach to come running to recruit them. This isn't always the case, is it? <laughs> not 99% of the time that does not happen. Um, you know, college coaches want to hear from players who are genuinely interested in their university and their program. Amen. So, so you can have a form email that you send out that has like a, a, a basic part that's the same that's sent to everybody. So I call it a form email, but basically you can just copy and paste it, you know, one or two paragraphs about yourself and about you know, your accomplishments or about the tournament that's coming up and things like that. But there has to be that part in there, that email that is directly related to that university or to that soccer program. Um, so, so when I get those emails, because we get them all the time, uh, we literally don't do anything with them. Like we literally, we don't put them, like if we're getting ready to go to uh, the ECNL event in Florida coming up in a few weeks, and if somebody sends us a, a generic email that is not you know, addressed to Coach Beal, it says nothing about the University of Richmond in there whatsoever, then we will not go see them. We don't even waste our time with them. Uh, as well as if we get an email that we can tell is directly from a recruiting service, where they'd hire a recruiting service to send out these mass emails, Again, there's no personality to it. There's no personal information about the University of Richmond. There's no direct correlation that, hey, I'm interested in your university. Then we just throw it in the trash. We don't even look at it. So I, I really encourage the recruits and parents. I, I realize it's a hard process, but I, I definitely encourage the recruits to do their due diligence, look at schools that have factors that they are interested in, whether it's the location of the school, the size of the school, the academics of the school, uh, the certain level of soccer that they feel that they can play at and, and look at those all factors and then email those schools directly and, and 
be specific about why you're interested in the University of Richmond or why you're interested in this school and that school. Um, and, you know, say, I'd love for you to come see me play to see if I'd be a good fit for your program. You know, emails like that get 100% responses from. And it's, and it's funny because the, the, with the, with, you know, just going out and doing a Google search, you can find so much information, you know, Hey coach, uh, saw you had a, a really uh, tough, uh, two, two, one loss the other day to, you know, your conference rival X yep. school and stuff, you know, it's unfortunate, you know, that the referee awarded a PK in the last minute of the match. And, you know, so sorry about that. And then I mean, you can find information everywhere. And especially if you're interested in, in that school, why wouldn't you want to follow along to them on social media absolutely agree and it's, it just takes a little bit of effort it takes a little bit of work and um you know with, with all these recruiting services out there promising the world to these kids they just think that oh i just need to sit back and just it's all going to come to me everything's going to come to me and that's just not the way it works you know you got to do you got to put the work in you got to send the emails you got to be consistent with the emails and the communication um and you know 99 percent of the college coaches out there will be very honest with their communication back you know, so if some kid, you know, writes us an email that, that, and we're going to go watch them play, uh, if they're of age, we're going to re reply to that email after we watch them play to let them know where they are in our recruiting process. You know, so if they're not a good fit, we're going to let them know that it's not a good fit for us. So that way, that recruit no longer has to waste their time on the University of Richmond. They can focus in on other schools that are more their fit or vice versa. I remember one time my son, who uh, was a swimmer in college, and we went to a, a university and the coach told them, said, if you show interest in our program, we will show interest in you. And I probably the best piece of advice, uh, recruiting advice I've ever received. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a tweet I wanted to kind of get into a little bit. We're talking with Marty Beal, head coach, University of Richmond women's soccer team. Um, there was a tweet, and I don't know the validity of this tweet. I'm just taking it at face value. Um, the transfer portal saying that there was 1,100 uh, female athletes uh, in the transfer portal for soccer. And they said that probably a vast majority of them were D1. What are your thoughts on that? It's true. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. <laughs> there, there are a lot. And, and there's, there's many reasons for that. Um, people just look at that number and be like, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. But, you know, you got to look into the reasons why. You know, sometimes, it, um, sometimes players transfer because of coaching changes. You know, there's a, there's a coaching change in the program. And so uh, they, they want to go look somewhere else. Um, or they, a new coach comes in, and maybe that new coach is, is uh, telling that player or those players that, hey, we don't think you're a good fit for what we're trying to do, the style we're going to play or whatever it might be. So, so there's that side of it. There's also the side of it that, uh, you know, Marcus, you know, there's a lot of kids who entered college uh, over the past year or so that never stepped foot on that college campus because of COVID. You know, they, they made choices, be, you know, without being able to get on campus and really get a good feel for what that college is like. And so now they're there this year and they're like, you know what, this isn't for me. So there's that aspect as well. Uh, then there's also the the early recruiting period that um, we're, we're coming out of that phase now, but there are still many players who entered college making decisions as freshmen and sophomores in college. You know, that they they committed to this, that university as a freshman in high school when they're 14 or 15 years old and they don't have a flipping clue what they really want to do. And so, you know, they, things change over the next four years. They get to that school they experience everything and their desires are different. Their ideas are different. And and maybe their level of play is different. Maybe they want a higher level of play, or maybe they weren't good enough to be on that team. And so they're in the transfer portal. So, so you have those aspects. And then you have, you know, what COVID, you know, I guess you could call it the, the good and bad of COVID is it gave everybody an extra year of eligibility. So now you have a lot of kids who are now looking to, you know, work on their grad school uh, degree, the graduate degree while they're still playing soccer. And so maybe they're transferring because you know, this, this other school has a better grad program that I'm interested in and things like that. Um, you know, so, so there's a wide variety of reasons why kids transfer and transfer out. You know, me personally, I don't have, I don't have a problem with, with this process. I don't have a problem with players, you know, having this opportunity to, to find their home and, and do what they want to do. Uh, it's, it's their college career. It's their experience. You know, um, I'm not alarmed by it uh, because I, I know there's many different reasons why. 
Now, what parents have to, to have to look at and players have to look at is look at the individual program. If, if that university has 10 players on the transfer portal, you know, 10 players are leaving, well, why? You gotta ask yourself, okay, why is that happening? If they are bringing in 15 freshmen, but each year they only graduate four or five seniors, why? Why is that happening? You know, so there's a lot of questions that, that parents should be looking at. Those are the key things that, in my opinion, that parents should look at is, you know, how many players are graduating each year versus how many players are they're bringing in each year? You know, you're bound to have one or two sway differently, you know, you know players decide to leave or something like that or stop playing. Uh, but, but generally speaking, you know, you want to find a program that things are pretty equal. Like when they grad, you know, you have, if they brought in eight freshmen, you know, then maybe six or seven of those freshmen end up graduating in four years. You know, you, you want that type of ratio. If you're in a ratio where you bring in 10 freshmen and only four are seniors, then, <laughs> then that, that raises some red flags in, in my personal opinion. And it's just about doing the homework, doing the homework, finding out. Yeah. It, doing the work. That's it. I mean, doing the work. All right. We're going to wrap things up here on the podcast with the coach Beal. Uh, just leave with, if you could talk to the players and just give them one piece of advice that you would have about the recruiting process and playing soccer in college, what would that one piece of advice be? I think it you know, goes along with what we were talking about. You know, do the work, you know, put the, put the time and energy into it, do the research. You have your, you know, every bit of information you could possibly imagine at your fingertips, you know, with, with the, the internet that you can just search everything. Um, you're on your computer all the time anyways. You're on your phone all the time anyways. So why not use it for some good instead of, you know, scrolling through TikTok and getting warped down that, that hole, you know, of entertainment. You know, just spend some time you know, researching and, and uh, communicating with college coaches and, and be relentless and consistent with it, you know. Um, and, and then, you know, also be realistic with it as well. But you, you've got to put in the work is you can't just sit back and just expect it to happen. That's like a, a person, you know, saying that they want to lose weight and they're just sitting there, you know, on the couch eating Doritos and they keep saying, yep, I want to lose weight. I want to lose weight. I want to lose weight. And they just sit there and keep eating junk food and junk food and they don't put in the work. Well, then they didn't really want to do it. They just had an idea that they thought was pretty cool. Um, so I, I would just encourage the, the, the recruits to just put the time and energy into it. You know, take, you know, 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, just to research and communicate. And that's not that much time when you really look at the big scheme of their life. You know, to do that on a consistent basis, to, to spend some time on their phone, to send some quick emails, to research some quick college, about some colleges, you know, they, they can do that. It's just a matter of that them being disciplined to do the work, as we've said multiple times in this podcast. That's a great place to leave it, do the work. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, coach Marty Beal, head coach, University of Richmond women's soccer team. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to talk with us today. My pleasure. I hope you have a great holiday. And thank you for listening to the podcast. We really appreciate it. Remember, make sure you like, subscribe, and share our program. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the West Virginia Soccer Association Beyond the Pitch podcast. You can catch a brand new episode every Thursday morning here on the WVSA Digital Network, or find us on our social media platforms at WV Soccer. Copyright 2022, all rights reserved.